Welcome to Three Devs and a Maybe, the podcast series for beginner web developers and general web enthusiasts. Now, introducing your show hosts Michael Budd, Fraser Hart, Lewis Keynes, and Ed Mann. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Three Devs and a Maybe. I am joined by my uh, co host, Ed Mann. Hello. Fraser Hart. Hello. And uh, we have a special guest on today in the form of Guy Routledge. Hi, Guy. How are you doing? Hello, everybody. Nice Do you to be here. Thanks very much for having me. your surname right there? Uh, uh, it's close enough. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it'll do. Oh, man. What's, okay. What's the correct pronunciation? Uh, I, I tend to go with Routledge. Uh, okay. What, what is close? Say? You said Routledge. Uh, you know, that's, that's close <laughs> enough. Close enough. Routledge. I'm pretty yeah. tired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for coming on the show. We uh, really appreciate it. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Yeah, so, uh, I don't know. Where should we kick off? Uh, Ed, good week? Hello. Uh, yeah, great week. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what did I get up to this week? Well, normal wow. work. Quadcopter. Talk about the quadcopter. Oh, yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, well, week started off. We're just doing this project, and we've uh, wrapped that up, which is also awesome. You know, it's always nice to wrap up a project. Um, this was, like, my first project actually working here, and I think it went really well, so that's quite cool. Um, and... Sorry, how do you define project? Because obviously you're working on on a single website in your current role. Is a project defined as a new piece of functionality? Yeah, it's like, so it's like, like a feature or maybe an upgrade or something. Yep. Um, we do it in a really cool way. Like, um, so I was assigned me and uh, uh, one person I work with, Kvan. Like, so he was like he was project lead on this project. So I was like this understudy type thing, like you know, new guy on the block and stuff. So yeah. it was interesting, like learning how to do things and how they how he would do things and stuff so it was it was a great learning experience and i really enjoyed it and um yeah it's kind of nice like we've been working this for about a couple of weeks now and it it is really different like coming from like a freelance background and a and a background with working in agency work to you know i think the goals are the same to obviously ship something you know that that is obviously what we want to do but kind of the way you get there is so different because obviously the client is your users um and you know internal people as well so it is an interesting one where normally the client you know you've got back and forth on emails and stuff like could you just dot 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 and stuff like that and <laughs> you don't get that you know the, the could you just emails are the great emails um, yeah but yeah so that went really well and then on friday um well we started playing with this ar drone which was pretty epic um a lot of fun i think i sent a, a, a tweet out on it with a picture and it's just like this 350 pound ar drone which is like like you've got it's got a camera on it and it's like you control it from your iphone it's just insane like so does it, does it use a gopro or has it got like a it's, it's own it's got its own camera, camera a hd camera yeah. and it records the footage as well so it's wow. quite fun like just seeing like this footage of just and you can beam the footage down onto your phone so you can actually look at it in real time so in real time and it also records it as well wow it, it's quite well, insane sounds amazing um it's a lot of fun just annoying people with it so <laughs> is it a bit like a node copter a node co- oh i don't know what, what is a node copter Oh, they're like these these drone kind of things that you can program with JavaScript and stuff. I've I've seen a few demos oh, done no with way. them. Oh, no way. Oh, it kind of goes that way over my head. So. I'm going to look at that now. So you add JavaScript to it, instantly it gets hits. You know, GitHub <laughs> yeah. goes crazy. You know, Everyone it's JavaScript. A bit of JavaScript. You know? Exactly. We, anything you can do. I think I think there's a lot of this thing with JavaScript that anything that's possible with JavaScript has probably been done with JavaScript, you know. We've got operating systems. We've got everything. I think that's not necessarily be... a good thing. <laughs> no, no. But it... <laughs> It's a thing that has seems to <laughs> seems to happen, um, but yeah, no, that that's about my week pretty much wrapped up. Awesome. Uh, how about you, Fraser? Um, I've been working on the .NET project that I've been kind of started oh, a couple yeah. of weeks ago. It was kind How's of interrupted. Going, it's going all right. I'm still still getting getting to grips with it. Um, it's been a little bit tricky because we're not using a conventional way of, of interacting with the database. But they've got they've given the client's given us a. Uh, access to their SQL server database, which has got a load of stored procedures in there. I'm not sure if I mentioned this last week or not. Um, so it's basically been trying to trying to work out how to interact with these stored procedures. And basically, it turns out they've given us this installation of SQL server where insert intos don't actually work on the version of SQL server. So I'm unable to perform searches on their database at the moment. So it's... Yeah, um, so I've had got no... read and not write access then at the moment. No, I've I've got read and write access, but the the store procedures. I think they've they've given us a copy of the database from their existing server where their current system that we're replacing is is living, but they've put it on a version of SQL Server that doesn't support select. Yeah, select into so like select start into. Oh yeah, yeah. so it doesn't accept that. Um, 
and yeah, we've not been able to get in contact with the client to find out if we need access to another database, but they've given us the existing project or they've given us the files for the existing project that we're actually going to be replacing to try and work out from there. But that's in a completely different version of .NET that I've never seen before anyway. So it's kind of like balancing these two things and trying to kind of troubleshoot between, between the two. Um, so that's, that's been interesting, but like I always say, like it's, it's really good fun trying to learn new stuff and, and get my hands dirty with new technologies and just for the, from the point of view of expanding my skill set as much as anything else. And it's, yeah, so it's, it has been really interesting. It's been really kind of frustratingly flow, slow going because if you're, if you're doing stuff in, in technologies that you kind of, you know, and you're familiar with, then things progress a hell of a lot quicker. Yeah. Um, so I've had that and then that's kind of been interspersed with a few kind of project launches that have been going on in the company that I've not been a part of, but as the final scramble to get things out by the deadline, I've been kind of yeah, You're been, kind of tag yeah, teamed kind in, of, yeah, yeah, like tagged tagged in and, 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 and working on with that. So it's been a it's been a full on week, um, but it's it's been an enjoyable one. It's been good. Well, at university, did you play around with Java and stuff? No, nah, like, nothing at all. Because so this is your first time with a compiler. It is, yeah, and like, it's been it's yeah. been horrible because my machine at work isn't too too speedy. Um, oh, yeah, because no. I've got an SSD on my on my on my computer at home so everything's nice and fast and, and everything and I've got this kind of this big sluggish PC that I'm working with uh, at the office and then yeah so you make a bit of change to the code and then you, you kind of you run the project and it does all the compiling and it takes like I don't know like 50 or 60 seconds before you can actually see if what you've done is working oh no it's not a repl loop is it it's not this no. easy quick you know and I'm sitting there yeah, I was like I was doing Google search it's like what's the uh, the .NET equivalent of print R <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is the thing, though. I mean, you know, it's like, but have you enjoyed like C sharp and um, like, the language? And... Yes, you know, it, yes and no. I think the whole process is quite frustrating just because it has been so slow going. But again, it's been satisfying in the fact that it's 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 teaching me new skills, and I am I am learning That's a lot it. more. So yeah. it's kind of it's got its pros and its cons. Um, but it's it's going to be an interesting one anyway. And it's 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 a good client to be able to have on my CV. Like I can't really, yeah can't say the client, but if you think James Bond and sports cars, like yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. I was going to say that was exactly. Yeah, so that's exactly, an awesome yeah. client. Okay. Yeah, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty good client. So it's it's a nice one to have on the CV anyway. Um, but yeah, it's it's certainly been interesting. And, and yeah, I've got I think I've got till February to get this project out the door. But obviously, I want to want to kind of get on with it as quick as possible. Michael, how about you? Good week. Uh, yeah, not not too bad. I mean, I've been working on a Magento site this week, which... Um... What's Magento? <laughs> I've never heard of that before. Like, you don't mention it ever. Like, yeah, as a... uh, I, I really wasn't a lot of work to do, but um, I got asked how long it would take, and I just said, look, a week. It's been bitten once, isn't it? And you're just like, you know, you know from experience what problems could arise, and they do arise. The bulk of this work was JavaScript, and, um, you know, Magento, I, I think it ships with prototype JS. No, uh, does it really still? Shit I'm pretty sure wow. it does. Yeah, well, and scriptaculous, those two, yeah, that combination, <laughs> the lethal combo there. And you know, you do this whole jQuery no conflict thing, and I swear you still get conflict sometimes. But I don't know, probably just me, the developer. But um, yeah, that was okay. I, you know, I said a week, and it did take about a week to be fair. And uh, but that was okay. Um, so is that using then scriptaculous and uh, prototype? Uh, with jQuery as well, exactly. in no conflict mode. To be yeah, honest. yeah, that's it. So, um, mm-hmm. but there's like two main ways you can get around it, isn't there? Like you can do like the the whole. I'm sure the uh, the way that you guys do it, like you know, var j equals and then jQuery or whatever. Yep. And then there's another way you can do it, isn't it? Where you like did the whole like um, document ready thing, and then you pass in the dollar and. You, oh yeah, so yeah, you put a self invoking function, yeah. and then say jQuery is now dollar for you in this context. Yes, yeah, and I found that, that way didn't actually work <laughs> particularly well. But uh, mm-hmm. there we go; it's probably me. But anyway, got it working. So that I blame Magento. Look, yeah, in that type of thing, we we can we can. Yeah, blame. and then I installed a module because basically they just wanted like two extra fields adding on the checkout page, which you can't do with Magento, not easily. So what? I installed this free <laughs> module. And, uh, like WordPress plugins, yeah? Yeah. Like, yeah, plugin. I've got a plugin for that. <laughs> exactly. So I downloaded this, uh, this module thing that allowed you to add input fields. And then when I got into it, I realized it only let you add one. <laughs> it was literally. What? Yeah. What? And I just to add... Yeah, exactly. So I then ended up doing a, a pretty nasty hack. Hope the client's not listening. Uh, just <laughs> <laughs> hard coded in an extra, uh, input field, which is, Fun. Why could you only do one? Was that like it because it's the free version, or um, it was just this this guy basically built this module, and uh, 
it wasn't. He only wanted one. That he thought <laughs> yeah. specs or one. You know, I checked the ratings. You would ratings. only ever want. You'd only ever want one extra field. Exactly. Like yeah. N, no, you know, one to N, no. It's yeah, just one. That's it. But the ratings were all five stars. So this module, so oh, that's fine. And that's something we realised. Solidly like, adds one field. Yeah. And I saw in the question section, it was like, hey, can you add an extra field? Never got any I mean, answers. That. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that was fun. And then like, no one's ever thought, can we add extra fields? It's always like, oh, I'm satisfied with the one. Crazy, yeah. crazy stuff. But I had that going on. And then uh, I think I probably told you guys last time, but I've done a little bit of freelance. I, I literally, this guy asked me to do some work and I, it's awful. But I said to him, it's like, look, I did put up my rates a little bit and I did say, look, you could get this cheaper from 10 other developers. And he still came back, so you wanted me to do it. I was like, oh man. No way. But I need the money in a minute. So I kind of take on that work and instantly regretted it. Uh, is it, just, is it an interesting project at all or is it kind of just one that you um, didn't? Part of it is. About? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, basically you wanted like an internal messaging system. It's, it's like a social network site. So. Right. Um, but I got that bit done. New Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now he, he, wants, like, he has heard of like Bebo and uh, MySpace, yeah? Yeah. Sorry, what? Uh, yeah. <laughs> My, MySpace is the way to go. Yeah. But the well, second I do hear back, the big money is in the next Facebook. That's that's where all the big money is going to go. <laughs> yeah, I wish, yeah. People yeah. with ideas never seem to come up with that. Exactly. Um, but the second part is like he wants an instant chat type thing, like Facebook style. Yep. So I've been looking into that and... Uh, because I don't want to do the whole long polling thing because it's not scalable. Not, I mean, I don't know if this site will ever have huge amounts of traffic, but I've got to make something that's scalable. And uh, yeah. so I've been looking at, ideally, I wanted to download some sort of open source project that I could just put in, but I can't really see too much. And so I started off playing with Node and that looked good. But Yeah, because you were saying that you, was it you that followed the tutorial on Node how to get yeah. the. Yeah, it was chat. really, okay. really yeah. good. But I think my lack of experience meant that integrating it into my PHP app right. would have been a bit of a nightmare. So I then started looking at uh, using WebSockets with PHP and I used a PHP library called Ratchet, um, which was really cool. Again, just follow the tutorial and it's amazing. You can just literally open up a couple of browsers and you start chatting away and it, it's, yeah. it starts popping up on both. And it's actually just listening rather than actually doing the whole a uh, long polling solution. So right. that's pretty good. And I'll be able to do it in that, but it's going to be time consuming. So yep. if anyone wants to listen to this podcast and they do know of an open source project that I can um, use, please do let me know because that will save me a lot of time. Yeah. But yeah, that's been my week really. Just, how's, how's Fatherdom treating you anyway? Yeah, really good. He's yeah. still really good. He, uh, he wakes up once a night, literally two o'clock in the morning every night. That's and that's awesome. it. Because you hear horror stories, don't you, of like yeah. people having kids and then that's that's it. Like you get yeah. an hour of sleep at a time and Yeah, yeah. Oh, so I wouldn't uh, like that. I didn't <laughs> <laughs> that's it. So uh yeah, I won't bang on any any more about my week. So I guess uh Guy would be would it be alright to introduce yourself a little bit like um how you got into programming and what your kind of forte is and uh uh Yeah, and, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. I mean um my uh my area of, uh, of expertise, if uh, I was as much as I hate that word, because <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm pretty much making it up as I go along every day. Yeah, but uh, I, yeah. I definitely <laughs> hang out on the on the front end of things. So uh, hearing about stuff like .NET and C Sharp, it's uh, you know it's yeah. it's fascinating because it's a whole other world. But uh, it's it's yeah. you know certainly stuff that uh, I wouldn't say I, I understood any of it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I hang, hang out on the front end of things. Um, I've been I'm currently freelance, but used to work for for an agency in house for a couple of years. Um, but quite enjoying the variety of things at the moment. Um, I've had lots of bitty projects recently. So a few days here, uh, a week there kind of, kind of stuff, which has been, you know, good to keep the variety, but I'm really looking forward to getting something to sink my teeth into. Yeah. Um, That's very cool. but, uh, I mean, when did I start? I guess, uh, back in, back in 97, I think is what I've worked out was when I made my first website, um, as part of like a school project. So. Yeah. It certainly wasn't beautiful, uh, and uh, it and was it a, a welcome to my homepage? Like, uh, <laughs> like, I mean, my first website was a yeah, welcome to Fraser's homepage. <laughs> oh, Everyone's no. going to visit it, yeah. you know. It was it was worse than that. It was uh, it was a friend's fan site, <laughs> right? You know, a fan, a, sorry, a fan Marquee site for text? a friend of yours. Like you had a really popular. Friend no, 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 for the for the TV, TV show. show. Oh, really? It's even oh, more, you know, embarrassing. Please tell me it's still up. <laughs> bright yellow background. Around. You know, uh, yeah, Mark's do you have a copy of the 
Is, yep. there, is there anything? Is there a copy of this we can? Uh, no, I, I, if there was, it, I would have burned <laughs> banished it. Banished it from the internet. <laughs> the internets do not have this. Anymore. No, I mean, you know, it's. I guess it would be interesting to look at from a kind of. It's, what is it? It's like the, um, the the drawings from school that your parents keep for, for <laughs> yeah. no yeah. apparent reason, but they're like, "This is beautiful." No, it's not. <laughs> yeah, it's not it's just, was it building yeah, tables? We'll, or we'll print it out and we'll put it on the fridge. <laughs> um, yeah um i don't think it was even built in tables it was just like one big column of text wow right um but uh yeah so that was you know back way back in the 90s um and i i used to do it as a as a hobby it was you know instead of going down to the shed and making things out of wood or whatever i would uh make things online for for fun oh well not even online really but just uh playing around on the computer um and yeah it was something that i you know enjoyed and did a little bit of here and there um but instead of going into it as my first career, um, I actually was a, a cameraman in the film industry for uh, about five, six years. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Which was good fun, um, really good fun actually. But uh, not so what, the what not have the we most seen lucrative. Your work? Have you have you been in like Jurassic? Well, have you not been in <laughs> by Jurassic Park or? Any no, I did. Um, I I did a few series of the Darren Brown TV show. Okay. Oh wow, um, wow that's so, pretty cool. cool. Yeah, that's it was really really good fun actually. Uh, so, super nice bloke as well. He's um, awesome. Yeah. So in some of the past episodes, you can actually see me walking around. I used to do steady cam for them. Uh, That's so cool. Yeah, it was good fun. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, the work was very sporadic, and uh, um, and even though it's you know almost as well paid as as uh, development stuff, because it was so hit and miss, it, um, meant that it was hard to make ends meet. So I went looking for something else, and uh, and you know remember that I quite like this uh, this yeah. web stuff. You like this friend? You saw the friend page again? You like? Yeah. <laughs> I like friends. I like web. Design. There you go. Um, so yeah, so um, I, I got my first job working. For, I was working in house for a for a fashion company, and uh, would you believe it that they were still using tables even about four years ago? It was really? terrifying. It was all this hand rolled PHP framework that they'd made yes! cobbled together. Everyone yeah. makes their own. And then uh, and then they were like, "No, we're going to be smart. We're going to move it on to Cake PHP." But I don't know if they even got around to doing it. But right. <laughs> so were they was, running uh, all the functions off like a functions.php that was included on the top of oh, every file? I'm sure. Oh, yeah yeah <laughs> um but so i, I had the the, uh, the opportunity to learn on the job basically which was nice um read a lot of books watched a lot of screencasts and yeah. uh kind of you know cobbled enough together to to uh invent a cv and and uh and then make it up as i went along really um, <laughs> but it's been great ever since That's really really enjoyable cool. So did you go from, from working in the fashion house doing kind of development there to going freelance or was there a step no, in between? I, yeah, so I was doing a bit of everything there. I was, cause I, you know, I did some photography for them and I was doing, I was doing a bit of design as well as yep. front end, uh, front end development, but I actually started to enjoy the front end stuff more than the design stuff as I yep. realized I'm not the most amazingly visually talented person ever. Right. Um, but really enjoyed Welcome the to development. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. So yeah, I, 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 you know, really kind of, um, turned my focus into doing that because it was what I found most enjoyable. Um, but then from there, I got a job at an agency, um, based down in Chelsea in, in London. And we had some fantastic clients that, um, I was able to do lots, lots of really, really interesting stuff. Um, a lot of custom WordPress themes and, uh, little HTML5 games and stuff like that. So really, really good fun and lots of variety, lots of interesting projects. Um, and then from there, I've uh, gone freelance uh, almost a year ago now. Fantastic. Wow. And how have you found the transition from from kind of agency work into freelance? Were you kind of overlapping a little bit towards the end of your agency time, or did you just literally drop drop tools and then go freelance? Yeah, I mean, and I, I don't even know if freelance is the right word, really, because I, I tend to get a lot of work through recruitment agencies, right. kind of filling in the gaps. Like contracts. So, and, yeah, yeah, so like either uh, a one-off project or, yep. oh, we need someone to come in and, and, you know, help out because we're understaffed and everyone's on holiday or something. So yeah. I, that's what I was doing recently. I went to uh, went to a place in Wimbledon for, uh, what, about four, four to six weeks, something like that, yep. and just filled in for a project for them. But uh, Awesome. Yeah, and the thing that I find the most difficult about it is um, starting new projects when when there's no like outline of how they do things. Yeah, because a lot of agencies don't tend to be like really really hot on their process and yep. documentation <laughs> and stuff. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I'm starting another. I'm starting something next week um, using a framework called it's like Kahana or something like that. A PHP Kahana. P yeah, PHP thing. Uh, it's an old site developed a year or so ago um but 
I don't even know how I don't even know what the local URL it's expecting to <laughs> to start serving the app. So I'm gonna have to try and track down the guy who built the <laughs> original thing and find out how to get a copy try of the database. Down and interrogate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's like there's not even a README that says you know here's here's where you can get uh, log in to get the database dump or whatever. So yeah, that'd be interesting. <laughs> and how do the, the contracts work? Do you generally go into into their offices or do you work from home or is it a bit of both? Yeah, a bit of both. So yeah. uh, next for the next couple of weeks, I'm I'm going to be working remotely from home. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, pop into the office occasionally for meetings and stuff. Yeah. Um, I did a I did a six week project which was entirely remote, working with uh, the team partly in India, partly in Switzerland. Yep. Um, that was a nice experience to That's to awesome. kind of take a completely different way of working where everything was just done by Skype and yep. uh, managed through Basecamp and stuff. So yep. um, yeah, and you end up learning a lot more about what works and what doesn't through yep. working with lots of different companies and stuff. So it's good. Are you in a yeah, position where you can kind of think, oh, I don't want to do this or I do want to do this and uh, pick and choose your work or not really? Mm. Yeah. Well, I've found that the, the the market's really, really good at the moment. There's a lot mm. of stuff out there. Yeah. Um, so if stuff comes along and it's in a sector that I'm not particularly interested in, then I'll, I'll just um, pretty much ignore that. Yeah. Um, the stuff that I like to do is kind of in the like the food and lifestyle kind of area, which is what I did a lot of at the agency. Um, and, but that's the kind of stuff that I like getting involved with in my in my spare time anyway. So it's nice yeah. to work on projects that you align with rather than. You know, constantly getting calls about working for like betting agencies and stuff like that, where they want yeah. to do, you know, was it these uh, online casino type things? And it's just well, not really my thing. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's really cool. Well, I think we've got uh, quite a few CSS questions actually. Uh, Ed, do you want to uh, fire off with some of yours? It's not going to be like a Q and A, is it? I feel on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Probably a couple of months back now, actually, uh, on the podcast, we we introduced uh, vanilla CSS. Probably in the last, I want to say since 2006, seven, maybe, if not a little later on, like these pre-processors have come around. Um, you know, the idea that, you know, CSS on its own isn't good enough or the spec isn't, you know, kind of, you know, coming up to speed enough. So we're going to have these pre-processors similar to like JavaScript and stuff and ones like SAS and less and everything. And I noticed on your on your blog that, you know, like you're, you're a SAS man and stuff. So the first question I want to ask is, what is SAS and less? For someone who just knows CSS, what would SAS and less give you? And what are their kind of, yeah, what what, what do they do? Yeah, sure. So um, SAS less and there's another one called Stylus, which I've only used once. Um, but they all kind of fall into this family of uh, CSS preprocessors. Uh, and the idea is that you write a slightly different form of CSS. Um, it looks very similar, but there's, it's got lots of other features. And then you run it through a compiler and it generates vanilla CSS for you. So the idea being that you can leverage all these uh, tools and bits and pieces to um, to be able to write more efficient code or, or write it faster or have, you know write less of it and, and generate a lot of stuff automatically um, which is which is great I love all that you know efficiency stuff um, because I'm over and over again I want to you know find ways to you know get get the machine to work hard for me yeah, absolutely completely agree with that I think that's the developer mindset is that if there's something you do twice mm-hmm. then you're overdoing it you know we need to write a program that does it for you instead and I think yeah. So, so with Sasson, like, what are the differences then? Is it is it similar to like programming languages where it's the syntax and ideology, or it's so out, out of those three, Sass, Less, Stylus, they they all do a similar kind of thing, um, but they um, they do it in slightly different ways, and the syntax is different. But it's just like in you know in C programming or in JavaScript, you've got you know control flow and variables and functions and stuff like that. You've got all similar tools in all of these three. CSS preprocessors, but they they just implement them in slightly different ways. Um, but uh, I, I recently was working with Less, which is something that I've not worked with massively, um, and um, because I've done a lot more work with SAS, I, I did a bit of a comparison as to um, which um, not which is better necessarily, but just if you are used to one rather than the other, here's how to um, yep. get up to speed Transition with the other language. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so yeah, I wrote a blog post about it. It was uh, less for SaaS developers, uh, where I was just kind of picked out the things that, I mean, they pretty much all do the same things these days. So I get, the conclusion I came to is if you prefer one than the other already, then just use it because yeah. they both do the same thing, whatever you're more comfortable with. Um, but my personal preference is, is SaaS because I've, I've used it more and therefore more, more comfortable with it. And I, I personally, I prefer the, the, the look of the syntax. Uh, it's a bit cleaner and tidier to my, 
personal preference. My kind of understanding was, and uh, I'll probably get slated by listeners now, but um, that SAS was more powerful than than less. Yeah, I was under that impression as well. Yeah, I think it may have started that way, but uh, you know, I think there's been some nice healthy competition by having you know more than one of these things. It's not like they've got a monopoly. Um, mm. So I think less has, has definitely caught up in terms of what it can do. Um, it doesn't it doesn't do everything that SaaS can do, um, but it gets pretty close in in the majority of cases. Um, yeah. And I think for a lot of people, um, I would say most well, it's hard to say actually, but I, I would expect most um, preprocessor developers are probably not using ninety percent of all the features. They may be yeah. using twenty percent or maybe fifty percent. So yeah. for for one to do slightly less than the other isn't necessarily a big deal unless you yeah. really want that feature then go for the thing that, that can do that yeah no i know i fall into that camp like the, the, i use i use less the reason i use less is because we've got win less on on pc and in, in the office i use i have to use less rather than sas because there's no real way that i can i can compile sas um but i use it very kind of i don't need to scratch the surface with it to be honest i think the the main thing for me is just the indentation of of Sub, what do you call them? Sub selectors or, or whatever. Yeah, just the indentation. Like I've been nesting. able to in. Sorry, nesting. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a big a big bonus for me. It's just so easy to to write to write like that rather than have to do it in the old CSS way. And mm. variables and mixins, and I, I don't use any of the the kind of the equations and, and everything that goes into it. But mm. yeah, it, it definitely even scratching the surface. And it's such an easy thing to transition into as well. Like I don't think there's any reason that people shouldn't be using it if. If they're writing a lot of front end code, yeah, I mean the beauty of of the of, of both uh, less and SAS, they have um, a syntax which is almost identical to regular CSS. So you can you can yeah. literally copy and paste uh, an old CSS file into yeah. a, a less or a or an S CSS, which is the the CSS like file extension for, yeah. for SAS, um, and you know, any valid CSS is valid SAS or yeah. valid less. Yeah, and, you and then you start just dropping kind of in bits in. as you go yeah. in, as you learn more. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. And what do you use to, to compile? Are you working on a PC or are you on a Mac? Or uh, Yeah, I'm on a Mac. So, yeah. uh, are you on Grunt um, or do you WebKit? Yeah, or? I tend to, um, if I'm doing um, a new project, I'll tend to uh, set it up with a with a Grunt file to do to do many different tasks, not just the uh, pre-processing. Yep. Um, so it, it just fits nicely into that kind of workflow. Um, yeah. But uh, even even before I started using Grunt a lot, um, I would just use the... Um, well, I'd, I would use Compass as well as SAS, which is okay. like a library on top of SAS. Um, and so either using uh, the Compass or SAS commands on the on the terminal to yep. just to watch the files in the background. Um, there's lots of other ways that you can do it as well. So there's lots of... Uh, uh, applications that that kind of abstract away that kind of uh, weirdness of of working on the command line if it's yep. not something you're used to. Um, so there's there's loads of them out there. Some paid, some free. So something for everyone. Uh, yeah, I, I personally, personally use like CodeKit, and it's I think it's fantastic. Mm. It's, it just makes everything so easy. And like I do want to get my hands dirty with Grunt, but it, yeah, kind of CodeKit just kind of hands everything onto a plate for me, and it just just makes it too easy not to use it. Mm, yeah, sure, and it's visual as well. So when you're learning yeah. something new, if you can see it on a, on the screen and you can you know point and click around, it's a it feels a lot more comfortable. Um, whereas you you know a lot of I was as well when I first started using the terminal, I was kind of like, uh, what am I doing? What, am I gonna <laughs> am I gonna break everything? Um, but just like as something simple like you know open the command line and type sas watch or you know uh, or just grunt or whatever it is that you happen yep. to be using uh, that's a fairly low barrier to entry and 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 once you get comfortable with the idea that there's this kind of gateway to the behind the scenes of the machine that you can yep. do all this cool stuff with um it, you then start being able to do um get more comfortable with all sorts of stuff so i use git on the terminal and i actually write code in vim in, in the terminal as well so oh really um, good choice good choice <laughs> it's uh it's just so fast um and it means that i can work really quickly and, and spend more time thinking about solving interesting problems rather than you know uh reaching for my mouse all the time and selecting text and you know moving things around very manually yeah i have to say i i used uh grunt we had a bit of a tutorial work on it the other week and we just used it for compiling less and using the live reload um mm, yeah. that, that's amazing as oh, well, live yeah. reload. Yeah, you get that in CodeKit as well, right? That's you do, yeah, and yeah. it's such a time saver, yeah. 
Mm. Yeah, it's great. And I, I like to have a two monitor set up. So I have a yes. big, big monitor with all the code on it. So I use yep. lots of split windows and stuff to move everything around. Um, and then just working in, um, in the code editor, saving constantly. And then I can just glance over to the other monitor and, and just always seeing the most up to date version, yep. which is, yeah, it's great. It's a great workflow. Mm. It really is oh, like yeah. the best. So you're not having yeah. to sh- even like the, the process of like, command tab and then command r to mm. refresh and it yeah, just it, absolutely <laughs> saves yeah. a lot of time yeah yeah have, have any of you guys used um uh gulp yet it's a kind of like a grunt substitute i've he- heard no, lots of good no. things about it but haven't got into it yet that that seems to be kind of the next step like mm. they use no streams and they're very much unique style kind of thing and it it's very cool. I was going to mention that actually. Like Gulp seems to be the, yeah. the kind of next phase of what we want to do. Like I just um, got comfortable with Grunt, and now there's a new thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the JavaScript world. Yeah. You know, we uh, every week there's another. I mean, of course, just because there is something new doesn't mean you have to use it. Um, no. But uh, you kind of all, all the cool kids are talking about it, so you feel like you should at least check it out. <laughs> so you, you hear it on Hacker News already, and you're just like, "Well, no, oh, I need yeah. to know this." <laughs> I'm going to have to check that out. One of the things I was going to uh, talk to you about, actually, Guy, was, uh, I, like I said, I'd been doing this freelance work and I hadn't done any front end work in maybe a year and a half or something. And mm. I realized what a bad front end developer I've become in that time. Um, but, um, one of the things I was going to say to you, it's a responsive site that I, I've been working on, kind of in, inherited this code base and I'm just tacking stuff on. But I just find, I, I know I bang on about this quite a lot, but the responsive thing, it, it really, for me personally, it really does add on a lot of time. And mm. I don't know if that's because I'm doing it the wrong way or I was going to, I mean, what your tips are on, on, on CSS when you're doing responsive site and in your experience, how much time you have to add on to a project for that really. Yeah, sure. So, um, it kind of depends on the, on the situation. So I've, I've done some projects where I've, I've come on. Um, to a pre, like an existing code base, not necessarily really legacy, but something that has been pre-made. Uh, and then they want to add in some responsive features. Um, depending on how well the, the whole thing was architected in the beginning, if, if there's no, if there's like no grid system behind the, the layout, then it can be very, very difficult and very, uh, very fragile to take something like that and pick it apart yeah. and, and, and kind of shoehorn in responsiveness. Um, it's not impossible, but it does, it does, you know, take a lot more time because you have to dissect the code base and, and make sure that not, uh, things aren't kind of like conflicting with each other. Um, so my favorite kind of responsive projects are the ones that I get to start from scratch. Um, because then you can yeah. put all of that kind of thought in at the beginning and make sure you're going to be building off a really strong, sturdy platform. Um, so I, I mean, there's great tools out there, things like, uh, foundation or, or bootstrap, which I'm not a huge fan of, but it does good work. Um, and there's, there's many others as well. Um, but, uh, have, just having a plan when you start off in terms of being able to, you know, set stuff up and you know, solving the layout problem once and then using mm-hmm. it in, in all the different places is, uh, is probably the, uh, the, the thing that has helped me the most to, to work towards, um, doing responsive projects. And then if you, if you build it right to begin with the, the responsive stuff, you, you only have to write a very small amount of code to override a few bits and pieces at certain breakpoints just mm. as soon as the content starts looking like it needs a bit of help you can you know shift things around a bit um so it, it doesn't tend to add masses of time um out of say a four week build maybe a week of it could be uh, responsive stuff but um, i do wonder like uh for me it still feels like something that's really in its infancy and i wonder if even five years from now we'll all look back and think why did we do it that way and mm. but i don't know like you say i mean uh, Bootstrap seems to be uh, certainly for at my workplace the the system. What that is Bootstrap? Uh, I've never heard of this. Bootstrap <laughs> <before>. <laughs> no one ever mentions Bootstrap. I, ever. I have to say, I, I I've never actually used it, but it, because everybody does use it, and they just kind of say um, they kind of just put it on as like, a, oh, this will fix all my problems. It's a de facto, isn't it? Yeah, it's and the, it just kind yeah. of annoys me because this. I mean, as much as you can go quite deep with all of this front end stuff. Um, it's not, it's, it's quite, uh, it's quite simple as co- in terms of the concept, but, uh, you know, uh, I, li- I like working on stuff that, that is, that is bespoke to the needs of the, the project or the client or the design. So just starting with this like massively fat 
framework and then it's got yeah. everything. adding yeah, so more you stuff always find yourself kind of like hacking it you, you, there's no other way of doing it if you start if you start like a new project in to a, a bespoke look with bootstrap you pretty much have to hack it don't you to get it to look yeah. and it's, it's you're chucking importance everywhere <laughs> rails <laughs> rails Sorry, what? no no <laughs> i joke i joke we yeah. love rails. It, it, you know it's the same i think front end and back end now like the same thing where a framework kind of is this massive like you know thing that Loaded we all just monster. chuck in yeah mm-hmm. it just you just you know we load it in assuming yeah. that we need it all where we yeah. don't really need everything um but sometimes kind of... you need so much of it that to to add that add in what you need kind of bit by bit manually would would take a lot of That's time it. so yeah. you weigh out it the definitely and depends on it um i mean one thing that uh, you know not to be slating bootstrap forever in a day um <laughs> if, if you're doing an internal tool or something like that and it doesn't have to look amazing and yep. it's not public facing then yep. it's perfect because it's going to look quite nice and it's just going to you know it's going to do what it needs to do but using it as a base for an entire project is um you often get a lot of crafty stuff left like lo- lying around in the background um and then when you come to come to that project later on, you reading through stuff, you're going, oh, so we're using this, this, and this, and this, and then you find out that it's not ever being used anywhere, but it's all still being loaded up. <laughs> this yeah. redundant extra stuff mm. that yeah you're never using, and it's getting piped down to the user. Definitely, yeah, exactly, definitely happens, and you know I've probably done it at some stage as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think Bootstrap is kind of a developer's dream. I think, that, and same with like Foundation and stuff like this, that we kind of we're not you know designer minded. Um, so to us to have a pretty design, but the trouble is obviously now it's kind of been used to death. I think, mm-hmm. you know, everything has got bootstrap behind it. Um, so it kind of gets a bit like, yeah, it's another bootstrap site. It's almost as bad as just having plain vanilla HTML, CSS, you know, kind mm-hmm. of thing. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other thing I was going to ask you actually was, uh, from what you were saying, obviously from time to time, you probably have to work on other people's code and, and amend mm. it, etc. What, what are your pet hates when it comes to, uh, CSS in terms of syntax or anything really? Oh, how long have we got? <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it, it's tough because, um, I'm sure that there's, when people read my code, they, if it's not the same way that they're used to working, then they'll look at it and go, why the hell did you do it this way? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so it's something that, you know, I often do um, look at something and, and just kind of almost scoff and go, well, this guy didn't know what he was talking about. Yeah, right? that's it. It's yeah. like, what? Well, yeah, who made this code? And then you realize you do a git blame. You're like, actually, it was me. Oh, it was me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that, that's happened before as well. Um, uh, and I've been known to take a screenshot of something and maybe tweet about it, perhaps. Um, um, <laughs> um but uh, pet hates and, and certainly just bring it back to the like the pre-processing and stuff. Seeing lots of really deep nesting uh, is is definitely one of my pet hates. Um, mm. It looks kind of readable on the screen when you see it all kind of indented with the with the SAS or whatever. But if you think about what is actually going to be compiled mm. and generated from that, if you've got more than two or three uh, parts to your CSS selector, then it means a that that code isn't very portable to anywhere else in the site, but it also means that if you wanted to override something that that was similar, then you have to use the same or more number of uh, parts of that selector. Um, so uh, it can get it can get very very painful if you're working with a code base like that, um, especially if you just want to come in and do a few little tweaks. Um, because you know mm-hmm. designers and and clients they love to to change things from the the norm the system that has been set up. If you want to override a couple of bits and pieces in a in a code base that's like really really overly specific, then it's it can get pretty painful. Oh, you just chuck them at the bottom of the CSS with loads of importance and stuff. Yeah, yeah. that's, <laughs> that's all you there. need to do. Yeah, it's a <laughs> fix for everything. Like all the stuff that was like written when the the site was actually written, and then all the new stuff instead of going where it should do in the CSS folder. Yeah, just chuck it at the bottom. Just put import yeah. like explanation mark important next to it, and you're there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, sometimes it works, and sometimes it's about yeah. you know delivering something that you in know, a timely manner some, yeah. someone's going to pay you for it and uh yeah it, but it is you know you don't necessarily feel good about it but yeah <laughs> sometimes once you sometimes put an important happens. in something it just it literally is an infinity like it, it is. is important infinity where mm. then you're just going to put importance everywhere yeah. it's bad design well, it's funny because i i think that there is actually a time and a place for them um but that mm. time and place is really only when you're dealing with um a state that you want to f- to force to always be the case. Yeah. So let's say you had um, like some kind of um, some classes set up for like toggling visibility that you might do from JavaScript or something like that. If you want to add a class that does something like um, 
display none to hide it or display block to make it visible, then then you want to make sure that when you add that class, it's going to actually do it. So to do like, a, so I often have like a, a few utility classes in my in my SAS partials and and like is hidden, is visible, display whatever important, just to make sure that they they're going to happen when you use mm -hmm. them. That's really uh, interesting. So I think that's a valid valid yeah. use case. Yeah. But um, when you when you end up throwing it on there just to you just to win win the war yeah <laughs> then it's uh then you're and you know then it's a world of pain yeah you know you're in a bad situation as well when you're doing mm. inline styles with important on them as well because yeah. you can't override them with the uh, yeah usually yeah. it's because someone's not re either not had the time to to look or, or hasn't really grasped the specificity yeah. of, of what's going on um and it, it, it's one of the things that you know it, can be very difficult to learn in terms of what what all adds up to what when you when you've got these really complex selectors and stuff ids see it, uh, classes style like because they all add, add up to a number don't they at the end mm. it's almost like so when you should use a class when you should actually use important or in inline styling should you ever mm. use that i don't know sure i mean i guess there's, there's kind of two things to talk about there one is one is what your preference is in terms of the types of um ways you like to select things in CSS. So some people like to, to use an ID if they know it's something that is, you know, uh, like a singleton, like something that is only going to be one of on the page. Um, some people like to, to never use IDs and just always use classes because they're more portable. They're, they're less kind of, they have less overhead in terms of the specificity and stuff like that. Um, I personally use classes for everything. I don't use IDs, but it's, it's a personal preference of mine and it's, it's done me pretty good. Through, uh, throughout my development career. Um, but in terms of working out the specificity, I'm not sure how easy it's going to be to, to, to explain on a podcast, but basically you, you look at all of the component parts of a selector chain and you kind of count up all the different bits and pieces. So if there's any inline styles, um, that is like the first number that you that you form. Usually this is going to be zero. Um, the next thing that you add up is all the ID selectors in there. And then the next thing you add up is all the classes and pseudo classes. And then finally, all the elements and pseudo elements. And then so you get this four digit number at the end of it. And the idea being that n elements is always going to be overridden by, um, by one class because classes are infinitely more uh, specific than an element. So you could have a million elements in your chain. Please don't do that, but you could. <laughs> um, and if you just put a class on something, then that would, that, that would override it. It's yeah, it's one of those things that is a hard to explain in words, and uh, and b hard to you know keep keep in mind when when writing code. Um, so I try to to keep classes and and elements, of course, um, but uh, and then try and keep um, like the the level of depth to to two or three. So I use lots of classes. I suppose like that that then kind of goes into it, and also in the program, what finding names for things. Oh, that's good, the worst. Yeah, good <laughs> names, I think. I think specificity on names. I mean, naming, to me, is probably one of the hardest jobs we have mm. uh, because we make them either too generic or over-complexly, you know. Like, yeah. It's working out for that job what that is. And, and yeah. in a couple of words, if that, we have to be able to specify the meaning, the intent of mm. that class. I mean, now, it is funny, like, talking about CSS as now kind of a first-class citizen in programming, you know, as a thing that you know, is so complex now that we do need preprocessors and we need to compile it mm. down. And it's the same, you know, working out names is just insane because what you'll then do is, uh, I think the end the end result is you'll add a comment to it or something, you know, saying like, this is mm. what I mean. Yeah. And then that means your naming was wrong. Uh, you know, like you, you really need a good name, you know, and yeah, I think I've been bitten by that so many times. I think CSS wise, it must be the same that you kind of get bit yeah, by it's... what you should name it. It's tough, and I've tried a few different things in the past. Uh, I haven't, you know, completely got the the silver bullet for the way that works the best. Uh, for a long time, I would uh, use a lot of prefixes uh, to to group related stuff together. So, let's say I was working on a product page. If there was something that was um, something specific in the design to that page, I would prefix everything with like product hyphen title, product image, product sharing links, or, or whatever. But then that becomes very unusable throughout the rest of the the site, and there's likely to be some some repeatable patterns there. Um, so uh, it's yeah, the naming of things is is definitely very difficult. Um, I've started to use recently the uh, the block element modifier pattern. Are you guys familiar? Oh, what is the no. what is that? So it's it's known as it's kind of abbreviated to BEM. B E M, 
and uh, and the idea is that all of the the different kind of components on a on a page um they are built up of like a block or or a module which might contain um uh, any, any number of other kind of modules or sub modules um so like a modal box for example is, a, is an example of a, of a block um inside that there would be perhaps a series of elements like uh, a title or a, like a main content area or a button or something like that um and then you might have a um, uh, like an inf information mod uh, modal, uh, a warning modal, and a success modal, for example, and that would be those would be referred to as modifiers of the original block or module. Um, and so then it uses a slightly odd syntax of using double underscores and double hyphens to to allow you to specify the purpose of each of each class uh, based on whether it's a block, uh, an element, or a modifier. So uh, again, something hard to explain on the radio, but uh, <laughs> no, it's really uh, interesting. That is very yeah. interesting. Like, I've never heard of that before. Like I think the site is uh, bem.info, um, and, and I think a couple of the, the guys in the front end community, uh, Harry Roberts and Nicholas Gallagher, have, have kind of got slightly different versions on the same theme. And there's some really great blog posts out there about it. Awesome. Definitely have to put those in the show notes. Mm. Let's see. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I'll see if I can find some links. But it's it just it gives you a bit of a system for naming things, so you can clarify the intent of what the thing does as That's well as it. the name it's yeah. got and that is the most important thing all of this code writing business i mean obviously we're writing code for the machine to be able to process and render in the case of front end but you know equally you know interface with the database or or you know create a create an instance of a class or whatever um so that's one of the purposes of writing the code but the other purpose is to be able to communicate with everybody else in the team and so you want to be as clear as possible and clarify the intent of of what you, the developer who wrote that bit of code, what you were trying to do or, or why you wrote it that Absolutely. way. There were the context, you know, of the problem you were trying to solve mm. at that time. I think it's funny because um, I'm learning DDD at the moment, domain driven design, and the idea is that you are, you know, that you know the problem is the forefront thing. You're trying to solve that problem. And another thing with uh, clean coders, which is like a uh, Uncle Bob type series, which is programming stuff but all it is really is like the idea is if you write a comment for something you failed in the naming of something you know you, you have failed like in the sense that so, you know a good name for you you have to find a name for something and it should be you know when you're reading the code itself or you know the syntax or the markup or something there should be understanding from that you shouldn't have to add in an extra layer of commenting or something like that to be able to tell you what's going on I mean, sometimes comments have a have a place, but I've, I've also heard this thing recently that, that comments are a code smell. Absolutely, yeah. Um, but well, uh, they're overused. You want... I think. I think that's. Yeah, uh, yeah, possibly. Well, it's weird because they they always used to be underused. You'd see reams and reams of code where no one had told anyone what was going on, and they hadn't. It wasn't self documenting, so it was like, well, I've got to read this whole bloody thing now. <laughs> um, but um, uh, sometimes to just to explain why something was done, I think is maybe a good a good reason for for putting a comment in because sometimes you might as as one developer you might look at it and go why the hell have they done that i could do this much more efficiently in like two lines rather than 20 but there may be like a legacy reason yeah, for it as a prerequisite like of, of the mm, problem yeah, yeah it's like yeah. it wasn't that we're not as good as you they had you know extra knowledge <laughs> no, at exactly. that time that you know one of the things i was going to bring up um it sounds like a bit of a silly question really but um Obviously, you refer to uh, like when you made your first site in what was it, ninety seven, and I was probably <laughs> about the same, really. And I, I kind of did all the, the uh, usual beginner things, like read a few books, and I think I created my first site with tables and stuff. But one of the appeals was that you could pick it up quite easily, and mm. CSS, like a pretty easy learning curve. One of the things I was wondering is how you feel about it. Is is it becoming a little bit more difficult, or is it just becoming larger and is there a, a threat to, to people who are getting into the industry especially people who aren't coming at it through it like a university background or something like that or a college background is it becoming a little bit more intimidating to those people yeah, that's, an, that's a really interesting question um, and i think it's, it's kind of difficult because it depends on what it what it is that you need to do or want to do yeah um so i mean there's there's so much stuff in CSS now. There's been a huge kind of push to add new things uh, in, over the recent years. Uh, and some of it, 
I've never even used before. And the, mostly the reason for that is because it's not ready for client work, as in the browser support isn't deep enough for me yeah. to go and use Flexbox on a site that needs to be supported by my client in IE8 or, you know, or using the new, uh, grid layout module, um, which looks really, really interesting. Uh, you know, we can finally get away from floats, but we can't yet because they're the only way to do layout in, in old yep. browsers. Um, so, so yeah, if you were, if you felt that you had to learn everything in order to go and get a job now, then I would say, yes, that's absolutely overwhelming and, and, mm. you know, would take, would take a, a really long time if you were trying to teach yourself just by reading book, books and blog posts and, uh, listening to podcasts and stuff like that. But, um, in terms of the, the barrier to entry for, for just being able to do something that looks modern and works well is, is still pretty low. Um, mm. I actually teach front end development, um, uh, for, for a company called General Assembly. Um, so we do like a part time 10 week course and, um, we, we intro basic HTML in terms of the, you know, structuring the content of the document, uh, and then basic CSS, like changing the colors and the fonts and the, uh, mm. making things, you know, some very, very basic layout stuff. Um, and within a matter of hours, um, over, a, over, a, you know, a few sessions, they, the students are able to to put put you know this this uh, new knowledge into practice and and go and make some stuff of their own. So I think with very early on they go and make like a CV website for themselves, which is you know a useful mm. thing to to have anyway, as well as you know really good way to to put into practice this, some of the stuff they're learning. Definitely. I mean, I guess it's just hard to say to, to sort of who's just literally just playing around Google, having a look at trying to learn some stuff, and and, and for them to know, you know what. They probably don't need to know about transitions or animations right now, you mm, know, to make yeah. that CV site. Um, yeah. but I guess you could say down. the same about any other language. I mean, mm. uh, you could say the same things about PHP, I guess now. Um, so I mm. guess it's a tricky one, but I, I certainly agree with you. I still think the barrier to entry is quite low. Yeah. Cause, uh, as, and the, the more that you start playing around with, with different things, the, then, then you can just kind of, um, bundle on all that extra, extra stuff. Yeah, you don't have to be able to, don't have to be able to do it all from day one. Um, I mean, certainly, you know, I I took a job somewhere and, and didn't know anything about like the server side of stuff at all. Yeah, but learnt learnt what I needed to as as I as I went along. So yeah, uh, and I think that's the thing. It it can be scary when if you've never read or written code before, then looking at looking at an existing project or, or kind of looking at a blank screen and going, how the hell do I start is, you know, can be intimidating, but yeah, there's yeah. so many awesome resources out there, um, to, to help you out that, um, yeah, it's definitely becoming, uh, something that a lot of people are interested in doing, which is cool. I think perhaps the, the people who do well in this industry are the ones who, who aren't scared of the stuff they, they don't <laughs> know because it, there's so much stuff that even, you know, people have been doing it for years don't know. But it's mm. the ability to to get find those to resources. Work it out, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you guys have mentioned a couple of things uh, on this call already that I hadn't heard of, and and likewise, yeah. I think I mentioned a couple of things as well. So yeah, yeah, yeah. you can't know everything because it's, oh, it's no. a massive field. Yeah. And that's the cool thing about the job is that you know there is always stuff to learn. I mean, it'd be boring if we. I mean, yeah, it keeps it, it interesting because you know that there's yeah. All, yeah, there's always different ways of doing things, and there's always new technologies that's going to allow you to do things that you can't currently do. And it, yeah, mm. that's that's what I like about it. Mm, I certainly okay. feel like there's a lot of stuff that I'm still doing in JavaScript, which I should be doing in CSS. And that's where I really need to improve and, and <laughs> really nail the, the more modern stuff. But uh, mm. I'll get there. But then there's, I mean, there's so much JavaScript craziness going on at the moment. Like I, I get called a lot about like JavaScript engineering roles, like like software development roles, but just yeah. using JavaScript instead of using, uh, you know, Ruby or, or PHP or something like that. Um, and so yeah. a, a lot of people are talking about Angular at the moment. And, you know, so even myself as, you know, an experienced developer, you know, um, I like to think I'm quite good at what I do. And, and just looking at that as like a, not just a new framework, but a, a completely new way of solving problems, yeah. uh, completely new problems to solve actually. And, and, uh, and being able to get up to speed with, with being able to make those kind of, um, uh, work on those kind of projects is, is hugely intimidating. Yeah. Have you spent much time in any of the, the front end frameworks, Angular or Ember or anything or? Not masses, no. no. I mean, I, I've, I've played around with them just to, 
just to see what all the fuss is yeah. about. Um, I've been through a lot of the egg, Egghead IO tutorial videos, uh, which are very, very good. I've checked um, those out actually. Mm, yeah. Um, very, very good stuff like, and really bite sized as well. So like some of them are yeah. just two minutes uh, up to like 10 minutes. So, right. uh, a little, little chunk of little nugget of knowledge that you can, you know, watch and rewatch. Um, they got some free ones, some paid ones now. Um, but, um, yeah, it's, uh, but because it's like, it's like app development rather than making a, making a, a, a website that, yep. that has all the bells and whistles on it. It's, there's a lot of different things to think about in this, uh, modern, modern age when, you know, everyone now, everyone used to just want like a WordPress theme and now everyone wants an app. And it's like, geez, what's, what's going to be the next level? <laughs> <laughs> Very good point. Uh, well, we are coming up to the hour mark, so I don't know if any, Ed, have you got any uh, final questions you wanted to uh, to shoot? Um, well, I've got quite a few, actually. I mean, one mm. of the ones I wanted to ask was uh, it kind of, I don't know if it's going to uh, start a, a massive conversation. <laughs> what would you like to add to CSS? Mm. Um, you know, that is an interesting yeah, one. Yeah, like, other thing, imagine an ideal world where IE6, <laughs> 7, 8 don't exist and you actually have standard compliant browsers. Um, what would you like added um, I know you you mentioned like grid systems and stuff like that's quite interesting. Mm. I've never heard of CSS having grid systems in built. So what what things? Yeah, well that's that's actually in some browsers now. Um, so it's the the grid layout spec. Um, there's a there's a great site put out recently by uh, Rachel Andrew called uh, Grids by Example. I think it's gridsbyexample.com, which is like a a whole list of of demos of uh, of this new uh, spec for creating grids in css rather than having to use a load of floats and stuff like that really really interesting stuff um so um i, I can't actually think of anything that that we're missing at the moment i'm sure that you know somewhere variables, along the line, variables well variables are also coming to, to vanilla css but um the syntax for them is weird and and i don't like it personally um because but also the preprocessors handle it so well that um it's it's not something that uh, I can see myself reaching for, and and it's something that that won't be able to be used until until the support is there for them. I mean, any any of these like big picture things, like you know, having all your colors stored in variables, or or having your layout done by Grid or Flexbox or something like that. Those are those are a really big deal if they suddenly don't work because you're in IE nine or something like that. Um, one thing that would be really nice though is to to be able to select an element in CSS based on whether or not it's um, uh, an element contains another element. Ooh. So at the moment, you can go down the chain. So mm. you can say, oh, that's in the CSS4 spec, actually. Yeah, parent selectors. Yeah, that, again, that is, uh, it's kind of, well, I've heard that it's coming, and then it's not, and then it's, it is, and well, whatever. Um, but um, yeah, something something like that would be really, really useful. Yeah, no, I fully agree with that one. I mean, the thing with with me and preprocessors, they, they do sound like a patch over things that you want in the actual language um like similar to javascript where you have things like coffee script and closure script mm. well more coffee script actually where you're fixing things because obviously the standard takes so long to actually move around you're going to have these idea that mm. you have a layer on top where you do your stuff on top and it then compiles down to the stuff that's bad almost um i don't know do you, do you feel that preprocess is going to stay around for the long haul or do you feel that once these kind of things the, the major type things that you feel like you know the idea of math uh variables and uh you know stuff like that like being able to be inside of the actual language mm. itself css do you think that they'll go away well i i think they may uh they may change in the way in in what they do uh and what they need to do um at the moment they they do a lot of stuff that can't be done in vanilla css but we have to remember that they are they're compiling down to vanilla css um and so there isn't there isn't a lot of magic going on in terms of they're not patching functionality and they're, they're not uh enabling you to do a whole load of stuff that you can't do in in real css because it's going to end up writing it anyway but they're they're like productivity tools that help you help you write the code that you want to write like a macro with, almost you know yeah, like yeah exactly yeah, like a macro just i mean so in sas you can you can create functions with return values and you can do flow control with if else and and you can create mixins and stuff like that which allow you to have like a little a little factory that's you know churns out lots of different colors of buttons or lots of different types of triangles or arrows or something like that um and um in, instead of having to write that all out by hand each time with a few little properties different um you can write a little you know 
little cookie cutter function or mix in or what have you, and then just use it many times. So <clears throat> even if, if all this kind of new stuff becomes supported in the browser, then, then I think there's still definitely scope for a tool that saves you time and, and allows you to organize your code a lot more. Yeah. Um, that's probably one of the, one of my favorite lesser talked about uh, features of the preprocessors is that you can split your code into lots of tiny little files and then have them all kind of uh, smashed together as part of the, the build step at the end. Um, because it just allows you to, to work in much, much smaller units, um, which is also good for working with, within a team as well. Definitely. With Git blame and then yeah, Git complex <laughs> and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Uh, what well, well, one other question? Because um, before we leave, like screencasting, you know, y- your screencasts are awesome. Um, like mm. that was one thing like, that obviously drew up, you know, us to actually have this conversation today. Like, you know, like so, what made you get into screencasting, and like, what's your setup like, and like, you know, what what drew you to that kind of field? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I I learned a lot of what I know from from reading blogs, but but more watching other people doing stuff in, in video. I'm, I'm a very visual learner. So to hear somebody like talking about what they're doing whilst also showing the code was I found really useful. Um, and then you could kind of see all the different, uh, all the in, like infinite steps in between uh, having the thought and writing the code and you, you see it as it gets saved along the way. Uh, so I really like that as a, as a learning method. Um, and then with the with the teaching work that I was doing, um, a couple of the students wanted to uh, learn about Git version control, and we didn't have time in the schedule to to like create any real um, any real lessons about it. And I, you know, it is quite a difficult thing to teach quickly to to beginners. Uh, so I, I made a, a, a video for them, and you know, it was very very cobbled together, very rough, and uh, sent it around, and and they were like, oh, this is this is really good because we can go and look at it in our own time, and uh, and and you know, get extra extra value out of the course. Um, and um, because of my love of using them as a learning tool, and because of being able to to make them for for the students. Uh, that was kind of what prompted me to to try and try my hand at putting a series together. So uh, it's it's the first se- season is almost over. Actually, we've got maybe two months left to go. About eight weeks of uh, of content to be released. Um, but yeah, I've been working on this a CSS video series called A to Z CSS. Uh, it's at a to z css dot com, um, and it's um, for each letter of the alphabet one topic one like five ish minute video uh, that kind of does like a little deep dive into either like a property or a value or a concept or something like that so it's been great fun actually um and it's opened a lot of doors to like being able to talk to you guys and stuff so that's always nice <laughs> so, so what's next then for you have you uh planned the next season uh i have a couple of ideas but uh not anything set in stone yet um certainly one thing that i've learned from doing well, I've now made about 20, 20 of the 26 videos, um, and it's very time consuming. Yes. Um, I actually <laughs> documented my, my process, um, when I was doing one of them, uh, and it, it turned out that it was about six hours of work to make a six minute screencast. Uh, so there's a, I put together a behind the scenes video. So it's like two, two and a half thousand percent, uh, speed. Uh, of me going through the whole thing so uh, that was a bit of an eye-opener to myself even when I realized how much work I'm putting into it so I might try and do something that is less video heavy for for the next series um, but I'm, I'm hoping to do more videos as well um, but I'm also um, writing a, uh, an ebook at the moment as well so I'm gonna Ooh. try and publish that as uh, as like a next step is that like a lean um, pub type publication or no i'm at the moment i am uh I, well, I, I maybe should look into these things like Gitbook and lean pub and stuff like that but uh i was just gonna you know uh, put a pdf out there and and stick it on the site maybe maybe bundle in some extra videos or maybe like an audio version or something as well i'm not sure yet but uh yeah just so there's something for everyone very cool well we have gone over the hour mark so i guess we should wrap up but i was just looking at um uh, that Rachel Andrew, uh, her website looks very cool as well. Some very good resources mm. on there. And, uh, I found that link, um, to what you're talking about with, uh, CSS grid. So we'll put that in the uh, show notes as well. Yeah. So Stuff. yeah. Uh, Fraser, do you have anything left you wanted to ask? Or no, good? not at all. The, the, the big question for me was, yeah, just wondering if, the, if you had any kind of ideas of anything that, that would be kind of nice to have in, in CSS4. But yeah, you've, you covered that with, yeah, with, with the parent selector thing, which is, which is good. Awesome. 
Well, I think all that's left to say that is uh, a massive thank you for uh, coming on the show. Absolutely, yeah, no, yeah, thank. Well, thank no, you for yeah for reaching out to us, and it's yeah, it's been great having you on. It's, yeah, thank it's you for having us. Me. It's been great. Definitely oh, should do yeah. this again if you're up for it. We would yeah, more than happy yeah, sure. To. And where are you based? Are you are you up in London or? Yeah, yeah, I'm in southwest London. Yeah, so, okay, well, yeah, because we keep talking about oh. going out and having having a bit of a booze up anyway. So if if that comes to fruition, we'll give you a shout. And uh, yeah, sounds and fantastic. Definitely. Yeah, we could grab a couple of beers. Awesome. Definitely, cool. And uh, shamelessly, I'm going to ask again if anyone is listening and they do know of an open source chat app, send it to <laughs> <laughs> tweet me about it or just email michaelbud6 at gmail dot com. Just so, because I know what's going to happen. I'm going to spend two weeks developing this app and then find out there's something that does it for me. So, uh, yeah, go on and get loads of abuse from my uh, (laughs) (laughs) co-host. Cool. Well, thanks for listening, guys. Uh, We will be back next week. Speak to you soon. See you later, guys. See you, guys. Bye. Bye. See you, bye. You've been listening to Three Devs and a Maybe. You can contact us at contact at threedevsandamaybe.com. Or follow us on Twitter at the number three, Devs and a Maybe.